layout. Um, we went over um, a basic example of things that you can do with the layout using just the basic flow model. And in the basic flow model, block elements are simply stacked on top of each other. Even with that, by playing around with the margin and width and uh, other attributes of the box, you can get sort of a, a respectable, a decent layout. What we're going to do now is we're going to go for other sorts of layout. So our goal will be to take the same HTML that we have, and our goal will be to not touch the HTML at all. All right, make no changes to the HTML, and um, simply have the um, simply have the um, um, CSS changed to achieve a different layout. Now we talked about a couple different kinds of layouts last time, and today we're going to explore them. And the first one that we're going to look at is what's called a relative position. Whenever you talk about something being relative, it means in comparison to something else. Right? So related to something else. So when we talk about relative position, we are talking about the position of an element related to Pardon me? Yeah, I, I, I am I am trying to think of what the address is for Canvas. So I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. It's, it's a little slow this Monday morning uh, going on here. I did not have my kickstart, no, I did not. I did bring my, my second cup of coffee in with me, so um, hopefully. I, you know, some days I feel like the Browns coach, like, well, we're off to a rocky start, but I hope, hope we'll rally in the second half. Yeah, yeah, right, right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not, not quite ready to throw in the towel. All right. So we're going to look at this example, and with relative positioning, you're positioning the elements related to where they otherwise would be. So again, in the standard flow model, you'll have boxes stacked on top of each other, like that. What I can do, though, is I can say, well, I got this one, and I'm going to make my navigation narrower so it forms a second column. And normally this guy would be here, but I'm going to push him up. This is where the flow model would normally put this next uh, block. But I'm going to push it up. I'm going to move it so many from the left and so many up. And I can drop that right there. And then I can bump the footer up as well. So we're going to use relative positioning to accomplish that. We already had two of these. layouts from last time. Here's the first one that we did. And what does the second one look like? Oh yeah, that's the, that's the more rocking version of it. So I'm going to take, I'm going to make a copy of this, and we'll call it prototype 3. Actually, I'm going to take the files from prototype 1. I'm going to work with the simpler version because it will be easier to see. And 
So that we're going we're gonna to use this one as the starting point. What I want to do is I want to move this. I want it to be stacked vertically. And I want to bump this up over here so that we have something that looks like this. So I'm going to do this in a few steps. And ideally, all my edits will be in the CSS file. So I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to make, I'm going to make a few changes to this. I'm going to get rid of some of the properties on the header, some of the properties on the nav. and some of the properties on the section, and some of the properties on the footer, just as my starting point. So we now have essentially this, which is sort of a very basic sort of a very basic um, layout. Um, I can do some things like, for example, I can put a border around my different elements. Something doesn't look right. Because I already have a border on the nav, but I don't see the border on the nav. Okay, there we go. That's what I expected to see. Not sure why it's showing the other way um, in the other browser, but let's work with this. All right, so essentially what I want to do is I want the navigation to be stacked vertically, and I want to move this guy up here, and I want to move the footer up. So we should be able to achieve that fairly easy. First of all, how do we make the navigation be stacked vertically? Well. That's normally how uh, list items work, right? Our navigation is a series of list items. And we had to make them stack horizontally by putting in some CSS. And does anyone recall the CSS that we put in to make them uh, align horizontally? The display and line block, exactly. So if we take this out, that should, again, make, oops make our LIs align vertically, which they do. All right? We can make it narrower simply by giving it a different width. So I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to make the width two hundred pixels. So now our navigation is there, not as wide. Now this guy, we want to push over 200 pixels, and we want to push it up. So we want it to go from the left 200-some pixels, and we want it to go up. So I can do that by putting my section. I can go and say with maybe... 600 pixels. I'm going to say position relative. And again, position relative is where you're telling the browser, look, here's where you, you know, you know where you want to put this. Move it from that position to the left and up. So I'm going to say left 200 pixels top 200 pixels. I will make 250 pixels, and we'll see how that ends up. So effectively what I'm doing is I'm shoving it over. I'm shoving over this 
to the left and up. So if I look at this now, well, it kind of did it. Um, if I want it to go up, though, I have to make it a negative number. So, or use bottom. Right. That would work as well. All right. So now it doesn't look like it's quite far enough over from the left, and it's a little too high, so I can fiddle with these numbers. Actually, maybe if I reversed them, it would be better. All right. And maybe a little bit more or a little bit less. And I can fiddle with them. You could actually sit down and calculate them, but I'm just sort of shooting from the hip. And there you end up with that as, as a layout. All right. Now, problem is, is where did the footer go? The footer is still like way down there. Well, we have to do the same thing for the footer, except we don't want to push it over from the left. We just want to push it up. And we should push it up by the same amount as we push over, we pushed up the other thing. So that moves that up. So now we're there with something like that. All right? And the way this works, notice that only the header and the footer um, resize themselves. That is sort of a restriction when you start talking about motor, uh, um, mobile compatibility, right? Because ideally, um, if you're going to use the same layout on a mobile device and a desktop device, you want your layouts to be more fluid, all right? Now, we can use different layouts on different devices. So a layout like this could work for us, but we probably would want a different, probably a more simple layout on um, mobile devices. And we'll talk again either later this week or early next week about how you get a different layout on a mobile device versus a desktop device. All right? Because the problem with this is it doesn't matter how wide the window is, we gave an, we gave a absolute, or we didn't give an absolute position, but we gave a, a size of these things in terms of pixels. All right? Now, we could make it a little more fluid by giving um, percentages for this, um, but we can run into problems with that as well. All right? I'm showing you these because these are techniques. And, and a technique is neither good or bad. A technique is either useful in a given situation or it's not useful in a given situation. All right? This is a, a, a way to accomplish, um, you know, to move things around from the page normal to... Um, uh, from, from the normal default spot that the browser would put them in. Another technique that's used, and this is probably best used if you have a very precise layout that you exactly want to achieve, is the use of what's called absolute positioning. With absolute positioning, you define a top and a left, or a right and a bottom, whoever said that earlier, all right, where you nail things down, all right, and it stays there absolutely. So, in other words, we could, in our layout, relative says relative to where the browser was ordinarily going to put it. With absolute positioning, we dictate absolutely where things are going to go. And again, we can dictate them in terms of position from the top, position from the left. So I could put this, the header, <coughs> 10 pixels from the left, 10 pixels from the top. I could put the navigation 10 from the left, 150 from the top. I could put the body 200 from the left, 150 from the top. And I could put the footer at that position as well. So I'll do that one real quickly. Again, that's also very rigid. So. If you're going to do something like this for a desktop layout, you might want to have a different layout for a mobile device. <coughs> so let's go and let's create a fourth prototype and do that.
Notice that, again, we're not touching the HTML. All right? Um, ideally, as I said before, before we start cloning and making our prototype, we will have gotten <clears throat> the HTML, the common parts of the HTML down to where all we need to do to change the layout of the site is to change the, <coughs> the um, CSS. So for something like this, I could give the width in an absolute number of pixels. And I can make the nav have that. And I can say for the header, I can give it a width and a height. And I could give each of these a, a width, a height, and a top, and a left. And I'm just going to sort of hash it out, and we'll see how it looks, and then we can make any adjustments that we need to. There's something I forgot to put in. We need to specify position absolute. Thanks. So I'm giving an absolute position. I'm gluing these things down on a certain place on the screen. All right? Certain piece on the page. All right? And again, I have a little bit of overlapping, but I could easily adjust that. I need to move this guy a little more to the left and move the footer down. All right, so actually I need to move I'll make this guy a little less tall. All right, almost there. We could fiddle with those numbers a little bit more to make them right, which I will do. All right. And almost there. All right, we'll call that a wrap. Now the advantage of this is this will look identical on every desktop machine. In other words, it doesn't matter how big the window is. And that's good in some respects. That's good if you have a very specific layout that you want to have. 
If you're doing something with the background image where you want things to be positioned in a certain place in the background image, for example. If you had a background image for the whole page and you wanted things to be positioned at a very specific place in the background image. All right. The problem is, is if we were to go and view this in a mobile device, this won't look good if we were to view it on a typical phone. Actually, that doesn't look half bad. Um, that doesn't look bad at all on the iPad. Well, actually, it doesn't look bad. But if we were to, if we were to view this uh, on a smaller mobile device, it wouldn't look uh, particularly good. Again, it's not as though this is a good technique or a bad technique. It's knowing when to use it and knowing the drawbacks to it. The advantage of this is that it will glue everything down in a certain position, which means the page will not be responsive to uh, when you resize the window. And that, that's sort of a big negative. All right? The advantage is, is if you're looking for a very exact, precise layout that you want to appear the same everywhere, this will give you the control to make it that way. And again, as we said before, it's possible to have different layouts depending on the device. So therefore, what you could do is you could have um, a layout where um, it's fixed on a desktop machine and it's not fixed for, a, for a, a mobile device. So it responded to the size of the screen. You could use a different layout for that. All right, let's see. We could, we could mix and match these things all day, all right? But there's two more specific techniques that I want to talk about. One I forgot about when I gave the overview last time, and that is when we use a fixed element. Now, there's a different bet difference between position absolute and a position fixed, all right? With position absolute, as we see here, whoops, As I scroll the window, I'm scrolling the page, and things move off the page. So that's position absolute. It's relating to that corner of the page. What if I want to make the navigation stick in this exact spot and not move, even as I scroll the other stuff? That's a different kind of positioning. That's a position of fixed. All right. And we can uh, achieve that by making that one element fixed and making the other elements um, just go with the normal flow. All right? So let's do that next. I'll make a copy of this that we will call prototype 5. And I'm just going to go in and I'm going to put in a margin of all of these of 250 pixels for everything. going to be my first step in this process. So everything is shoved over to the left. And as we scroll, it scrolls. All right. Now, as I said before, I want the navigation to be here. And I want the navigation not to move as I scroll. 
All right. So we can accomplish that simply by putting in we'll give it a width I'm going to do position of fixed and not of absolute. And then I can say top 10 pixels, left 10 pixels. And I probably should give it a height too. I have two widths in here. Oh. I put that on the LI. I wanted it to be on the nav. There you go. So now, the nice thing about this is, is as I scroll vertically, the navigation stays fixed. All right. So that's different from absolute, right? With absolute, it is pinned to a certain point on the page. And as that page scrolls off, the element leaves it. With position fixed, it is glued down to a specific spot on the window. So as the page scrolls, it stays constant. It's especially useful for um, things like, um, things like um, uh, navigation. It would be the main thing I would think of using it for. But I guess you could use it for the header or you could use it for the footer as well. And as you scroll, the header and footer would stay in place and the content would just scroll in between. All right. Now again, as I mentioned before, these techniques can be used sort of as a mix and match. All right. Um, and again, notice the beauty of this is because all the changes are made in the single um, CSS file, um, I don't have to touch those other pages at all. I got the HTML down, all right, and I don't really have to worry about anything else. All right, I just, um, I'm just good to go. All right. If I need to make a change to the layout, I only have to touch the CSS. I only have to change each HTML page if I want to make a change to the common content that's in all those pages. All right. Again, remember, we can mix and match these things. So there's a lot of different variations. But the last thing that we're going to talk about is floating. And floating is probably one of the most confusing ways to achieve a layout, but it's also one of the most powerful uh, because it truly is a responsive technique. And what does it mean when I say responsive? I mean that it responds to the size of the page. It responds to the device that the page is being viewed on. All right. So not all of these layouts did that. All right. This is responsive because the size of the page varies, or as the size varies, the layout varies. All right? But if we looked at prototype four, where we use the absolute positioning and the absolute sizes, that stays the same as we resize the screen. The page doesn't sort of conform itself to the shape of the screen. So before I, I go and make this prototype for um, the floating, I'm going to do a floating example. And I'm just going to do an example, and in the interest of time, I am going to put everything, CSS and everything, in one file. And I'm going to do a real scaled down page, a page that only has two elements. I'm going to have two sections. 
section one and section two. So if we were to look at this, we're going to see here's section one, here's section two. Let's give these guys background colors so that we can see them. That, by the way, is not a bad strategy if you're debugging CSS. That is, even if you don't want things to be a certain color, you can make them a certain color um, because that will help you see them. So for a section, I'm going to say background background RGB. Make it a gray background, and I will give it a black border. So let's view it again. There's our two sections. All right. I can give them a margin to give some separation between the two of them. So I'll give a margin of five pixels. And I'm going to give them a width of each. 30%. So there we go. All right. Now as I make this smaller, it gets smaller and smaller. I might want to set a breaking point to say don't make it any smaller than a certain amount. And I can do that via a min width. So this should largely be review of stuff that we have gone over before. So I give it a minimum width of 400 pixels. So. Make the minimum width a little smaller. So it will resize to a certain point, but won't get any smaller. All right. Now, here's the basic idea of floating. All right. Basic idea of floating is this. Notice when the screen is wide, there is room for both of these to be side by side. So I could have two columns worth of data. When the screen is narrow, there's only room for one of them. There isn't room for two of them. If I float these things, what I can tell the browser to do is, if there is room alongside of this guy, then put this guy right next to it over here. So right here, there's a lot of room. There's plenty of room for this section to be alongside this section. Whereas when I get to a certain point, there's not enough room to put this section alongside of it. See, there's not enough room for it. So I can accomplish that by saying float to the left. All right? So if I say float left, I achieve that. So here I am with the wide screen. 
and those two sections are right next to each other. Get smaller, get smaller, get smaller. It's able to hit position. Right at the point <clears throat> where this, the, mar the, the, the edge of the window touches this guy, there's no longer going to be enough room to put that in there. And this guy's magically going to drop down below this guy. So right, actually, I lied. Right when it hits the margin of that guy. So remember, we added a margin to that. So now it, it drops down and it's below it. And at first glance, this might not look like that's that big a deal. And it's like, well, that's a nice little trick. I can make the stuff jump around the page. But what's the practical implication? The practical implication is this. I can have on a wider screen, I can have multiple columns. On a narrower screen, I can have a single column. And that's a big deal, all right? Because typically, if you, if you look at many mobile web pages, the best ones are often single columns. Why? Because you really don't have the size on a mobile phone to have multiple columns. The, the font would be really small, or you'd only have a, a few words per column. All right? So on a narrow screen, having a single column is good. The reverse is true when you have a wider screen. When you have a wider screen, multiple columns are good. Let me go in and, and post some Greek text. So I'm going to put Greek text in each section. All right. Let's make the width of this 100%. Let's make the width of these columns 100% just to show you what it's like. As you read a wide column, like on a monitor, your eye has a tendency to move up or down a little bit. It's difficult to read going across because your eye has a possibility of drifting, either up or down. That's why newspapers are not printed all the way across. You have a, a newspaper so big, the print doesn't go all the way across. They have it in little columns, because then your eye can scan it easily and go down. So if I made it one column for wide screens, that would make it difficult to read um, in, a, um, you know, in, in an environment where I had a large screen. If I made it two columns on a narrow screen, then the columns would be really long and only have a few words in it, and it would also be hard to read. So the best of both worlds is a layout. The best of both worlds for reading text is a layout that is multiple columns on a wide screen and a single column on a narrower screen. So if we look at this, now, we get exactly that by floating it. As we hit a certain point, boom, it goes down and we have a single column of words. All right, so that's sort of the point of floating, that we will have multiple columns on a wide screen and a single column on a narrow, narrow screen. So a lot of our layouts that we want to make that we want to work both on a desktop device and a mobile device. 
we're going to use floating on. All right. Now, you have a couple choices when you're developing a mobile site. And we'll discuss all these again probably next time. But one of your choices is to, develop, is to develop two different CSS files and have a CSS file for the mobile and a CSS file for the desktop. That's a valid choice for in certain situations. Another choice is to figure out a single CSS layout that works both on mobile and on a desktop. And that's another valid choice. Now depending on your situation and your particular project and the particular um, thing that you're working on, either one of those may be appropriate. There's actually a third choice, and that is to develop a completely different site for the mobile device than you have for the desktop device. Now we explore all these options in detail in, in CISS 268, I think it is, the mobile web development class, um, which I would, I would suggest anyone interested in web development, that's a good class to take after this one. It's one of the good classes you can take after this one. All right, but if our goal is to have a single layout for both desktop and mobile devices, a floating layout is typically the way to go because it is responsive. It resizes itself depending on the size of things. So now that we've studied this, we can, things get more complicated if we make these things have different sizes. Like we could have one of our sections be an absolute width and another section be relative width. So I have two sections, section one and section two. These style rules, by the way, because they have a pound sign in front of them, they apply to the thing that has an ID of section one and the thing that has an ID of section two. That's a different selector. All right, remember when we first started talking about CSS, we talked about the thing in front of the style rule is a selector. It defines what gets that style rule. When you see a pound sign in front of it, it means the thing that has the ID of section one. When you see nothing in front of it, then it refers to the specific HTML tag. So this I made an absolute size. I made 400 pixels. The other one I made a width of 30%, I think, with a minimum width of 300 pixels. So you'll notice as I move it, that stays a constant size until, there we go, it pops down below. Using the floating position is, is, uh, can be confusing at times just because of things like that. And you need to remember that when you are figuring out how much space an element takes up, it is the width plus the padding plus the margin plus the uh, border. So if I made each of these 50%, let's go back to this example. If I made each of these 50%, each of those sections 50%, you'd think, well, they should appear side by side. They don't. Why not? Because I made the content area, that's this area here, 50%. You have to add on the margins that I've added on, and plus the border, plus any padding that I've added on. So if you make two things 50%, they're not going to fit side by side, oddly enough. And that's a little, a little tough for people to get used to. Um, again, um, take that into account when you're assigning percentages uh, to, to things. Now I could make, let's see if I could do this. Try to make this 46%. Let's make this 2% and 
the border 2%. Let's make the padding 1%. Apparently, it doesn't like a border as a percent. I have to give a pixel size as a percent. So it for sure can get confusing when you start mixing percentages and absolute values. All right, there we go, back to that. And as I resize this, certain point it pops down below. Okay, let's go and let's, let's implement this um, in our um, prototype. So I'll make a prototype 6. And I can make the header have a width of 100%. And I'm going to float left. The nav I can give a width of 20% and float left. The section I can give a whoops width of 40% and float left and the footer I will give a width of 100% and float left. All right, and again, see how things size. Now, depending on, and again, that's like right down there. Now, depending on the widths of different things, I've given a width to L these LIs. At a certain point, these are going to collapse onto each other. And that's where the minimum width becomes handy. So, for example, I could put the minimum width of this to be, um, oops. hundred pixels and then I won't run into a problem of those things running into each other because it will never get smaller than a hundred pixels and at a certain point it will drop below. Now this looks a little goofy because I have the border but if I were to remove the border this would not be a bad layout even on a mobile device. All right. Next time we'll spend a little bit more wrapping up uh, floating and then we will talk about um, having a layout for a mobile device, having a different layout for a mobile device than we do for a desktop device. Are there any questions? All right, see you up in lab.